vast and mostly unexplored. Are living Mesozoic still inhabiting the continent? Many believe they still do. Especially this man, Dave Wetzel, author and explorer. He is launching a 2024 expedition deep into the Cameroon in search of the elusive beast. Dime for Dawn is a non-mammalian synopsis said to be roaming Muhoroni, Kenya. Cal Bombay believes he may have encountered the creature in 1963. Well, my wife and I both saw it, and we, we asked for several years, we asked anybody if they'd ever seen anything like that. Nobody had, nor had I, have I since, but there it was, laying on the road. For over 100 years, authors and explorers have ventured deep into the Cameroon to have a chance to study what the natives call Okele Mbembe, a living dinosaur. Is this the product of superstition, or is it simply the case of misidentification? Tonight, you will hear about the 2024 efforts of Dave Wetzel, a famous explorer, author, and researcher whose latest endeavors will take him deep into the Cameroon to search for the elusive creature. Join us on this special edition of the Ropen Network. There's a good chance we're dealing with an organic creature or we're dealing with a supernatural entity. Pterosaurs, according to evolution, have been extinct for 70 million years or so. Our objective to research information that describes the truth about the entire cosmos. And the name of the business is SJ Polygraph, which is directly behind me, where the examination will be taking place. There's very good evidence that is indicating that they still are alive. Well, Dave, on behalf of the many creation authors and teachers, I'd like to say thank you for all your work, which has provided truth about our world in biblical apologetics and creation ministries. Thank you for being here. Greatly appreciate it. Well, Jake, it's my pleasure to be able to join you and excited about talking about some of my personal research and obviously linking it to our great creator, God, and being able to share how my passion for dinosaurs shows they are living evidence of a powerful creator. Amen to that. Dave, tell me, when are you departing for this Cameroon trip? Yeah, we have uh, we have our tickets in hand, and God willing, we'll be heading out right after Christmas, December 27th, uh, for about a three-week trip to Cameroon. We'll fly into uh, Yaoundé, which is the capital. From there, we have a guide who has been with us before. This is not my first time doing this, and uh, he will meet us in the capital We'll get uh, our goodies unloaded, God willing, into a large uh, four-wheel drive. And then we kind of head to the northeast part there of Cameroon, an area called Bertua, B-E-R-T-O-U-A. And from there, it's kind of rough roads going south. Uh, I'll eventually get to Yakaduma, which is kind of a, a, a really kind of outpost town. From there, it's just logging roads. And you kind of work your way down to where we can meet the Bumba River. And that's our goal is to put it on the Bumba River uh, and we want to float down the Bumba and along the way hit a few different rivers, the Beck River, uh, the, uh, there, there's a Lafunji River, uh, and there's a couple of others as well that I'd like to hit. Uh, but those are some of the main ones And this whole area is called the Bumba Beck National Park. It's a major area and uh, this is where they've seen some of this creature that we call Mokele and Bembe. What is it about this particular investigation and what do you hope to accomplish on this go around? Tell me about that. Yeah, so uh, the last time we went, which has been some time now, we went mostly on foot. Uh, we didn't really know what we were doing. We kind of were some of the first folks to go down into this area doing this research. There have been a lot of teams that have researched the Congo, including even the Smithsonian. Uh, the University of Chicago, a guy named Dr. Roy Mackle went there multiple times and wrote a book, Living Dinosaur. Uh, but the, the research in the Congo kind of came to a halt with uh, some of the civil war. You have a communist insurgency, and it's still a bit dicey to go into Congo. But the uh, but the Cameroon is very, 
very active. And so we were the first ones to really break ground, pioneer the research there in Cameroon. I'm talking about my friend Bill Gibbons and myself yep. way back in 2000. So it's been been a while, uh, 2000 into 2001. Uh, so we, but when we went, we mostly went on the, on the shore. We went along the banks of the river. We went in November, high water level, uh, lots of slogging through swamps, knee deep, hip deep water. A lot of their trails were underwater. It was the end of the rainy season. Uh, and so we uh, kind of, you know, you're hacking your way through with machetes and stuff. You're making a lot of noise. We came upon gorilla beds where they were still warm. You could feel them, but the gorillas are gone, you know, and you're, you're scaring everything because you're just hacking your way through with machetes and Good snapping point. things and cutting your way through uh, with a team of, of pygmies that are kind of, you know, helping, you know, make a trail for you. Uh, so it's noisy. Uh, the other teams, as I mentioned, they mostly have gone down to the bottom and worked their way upstream. But again, it's very noisy. They have an outboard engine and they have a dugout canoe. And bah, 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 Often wondered. So yes, we yeah. want to do something different this time. We really want to go in stealth mode. Uh, and we will have an engine, but it's an electric outboard. So this is the first time for this. And we're mostly going to be floating downstream. So we're going to go out of our way to put in way up and then work our way down to where the Bumba meets the jaw. You can see this on a map. Uh, but then we will try to go up a couple tributaries, including the Beck. The BEK River is one of our key targets. I really, I want to see what's going on up there because that goes right up into just remote, pristine uh, areas that nobody, as far as I know, has really thoroughly explored. Uh, awesome. And so when we get up there, we'll be able to do some wonderful interviews with pygmies and some of the villagers along the sides. And uh, with the outboard, with the electric outboard, the downside is how much power you got before you run out of electricity. But we will have a collapsible solar panel. So you can unfold this thing. You can lay it out. You can charge up your, your uh, electric motor again. It's going to take I a saw little while. Yeah, but we're going to mostly float downstream. We will try to get up the Beck and up the Fungi, maybe a couple of others as well. Uh, but we certainly want to do some interviews, talk to some of these people that live on the river and, uh, also just very quietly see what we can see, see if we see signs of footprints, maybe in some riverbanks, uh, maybe even a nest. Uh, and we have some trail cameras we want to be able to leave. We'll have a GoPro kind of stuck on the front of the boat, maybe even a couple on the sides. We'll see about that, uh, oh, depending yeah. on how many batteries we can take, but we want to have something always going just in case. You come around a bend and there it is. And you don't have time to get your video camera opened up. By the time you get your camcorder up, I've got a 4K, you know, small camcorder. Good, yeah. But yeah, by the time you get it up, you might miss it. So we want to have something that's constantly rolling. I agree. I agree. Now, we don't aim to shoot one of these things. Uh, I do carry right. non-lethal uh, form of protection in the form of a taser. And I can, you know, stop something in its tracks if it comes tearing at me. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'm thinking mostly of a hippo or crocodile. These creatures seem to be very reclusive. That is, uh, the pygmies that see them say, we're going along in our dugout canoes and they're paddling. They're not making a lot of noise or maybe they're floating with a current. And we come around a bend, we see this thing. And as soon as it sees us, boom, it goes under the water and it's gone. So it seems to be pretty reclusive. It doesn't really want to have interactions with people. Uh, it, you know, Maybe if you approached its nest, that might be a different story. Maybe if it was kind of cornered in a jungle pool, because there are reports of it just being in some swamps and some of the larger pools as well, yeah. uh, then it might be a different story. But hippos are just playing mean buggers. You get near their area, they don't even want to eat you. They just want to like bite you in half and like teach you a lesson. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah, I do remember you mentioning um, due to the age that we're not seeing massive creatures anymore, unless it's maybe marine reptiles, which can get very big. It's the ocean. These are land dwellers. These are quadrupeds. So they are most likely going to be a smaller version than what has been seen in the ancient world when they were with man. I mean, they're still technically with man, folks, but I understand the size difference here. It has changed. They're no longer these massive creatures that they once were. Dave, are you bringing videographers with you or are you just going to have cameras set up? I'm bringing a gentleman that uh, will be a little bit of the go-to guy for the photography. Uh, I'm going to be Good. operating the electric motor in the back of the boat. He'll be in the front with uh, some of the photographic equipment. And uh, the other thing that I'm bringing this time, and I think this may be the first time, is we're bringing some real good night vision equipment. And this is mostly from my research in Papua New Guinea, uh, looking for the roping. But we've got night vision and thermal imagers that we're going to be bringing with us. Now, good. 
I don't expect that this creature is nocturnal. I fully expect it's diurnal. But you know what? Let's bring it along. Let's see what we see. Uh, we're going to have uh, also uh, a little bit of an opportunity to do a flyover because when you're going upstream, you can't really get into too much trouble because if you start running into whatever waterfalls, okay, you stop and you got to kind of lift up and portage around them. But if you're going downstream, <laughs> you can get into trouble. Uh, you all of a sudden come around a bend and you're going over a waterfall. So we're actually going to do a flyover and we're going to have our Garmin that's a satellite linked up. And so we'll be actually marking on the map in real time the GPS coordinates for anything that looks like white water or waterfall. So we can slow down, examine them on the ground and maybe portage around them. Uh, so uh, that's some of our, our, our things. We're going to have the GoPros. We're going to have trail cams and there are, set, there, there are solar set trail cams. Actually, I have a little solar panel on top of it. So they'll be able to stay there for a long time. Uh, we're trying to get the resolution as high as we can, but excuse me, turning off the video so it'll be pictures only so we can store a lot and, and, and the, and the uh, solar panel will kind of keep it going for maybe years even. Uh, and so we're going to bring the trail cams and then we have the night vision, thermal imagers, uh, and we've got the GPS, the Garmin, the electric motor. So we're kind of going high tech a little bit, Jake, on this one. I think uh, you are. Yes, that's good. Angle. <laughs> good. I mean, the more gear, the better. I've had that experience myself with thermal and night vision. It really does help in case you see mm -hmm. something. Usually we've witnessed uh, wildlife like bats and anything that's mostly nocturnal. I agree with you. I think the Mokeli isn't necessarily nocturnal. He'll come out whenever he wants. If they're semi-aquatic, they're going to spend a lot of time in the river systems submerged. But every once in a while they could come out, which makes me wonder if you're passing through – you think there may be a, ch a chance to be able to notice if there's something beneath you that could rise, potentially knocking your raft over. I think you understand there's, when I look at this, there's some dangers here, but this is what I believe makes everything that much more enjoyable. But I think you're aware of those dangers of what you need to do to take precaution. I don't think these things stay under real long. I think they are just going under to get away and go somewhere. Uh, and so I, the other thing people say, well, what about a drone? Okay, you could bring a drone. Uh, again, you're talking about a lot of noise. These things make a racket. Uh, and they do. The problem is if you're trying to come in from above, okay, the jungle canopy is so thick. That's what our experience was last time is if we were on land, we couldn't see the river because the, 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 the canopy comes right down. Everything's trying to grab sunlight. So if you're on land, you're not seeing out of the river because the canopy's there. If you're on the river, which we did some of that, you're not seeing the shore because this jungle canopy is like a curtain and you can't see the shore. So it was either take you pick your poison. Either you were seeing the stuff on the shore, but you're slogging and nasty, you know, trying to get through swamps or you're riding the river, which is much more comfortable, but then you can't see the shore. So that's why this time we're going a little later when the water levels down, hopefully we'll be able to ride quietly along and see the shorelines. That's at least our hope. I see. Okay. I think a lot of people probably ask about the drone thing. That whether or not it's a good option or not, but they do make a lot of noise. They're getting better, but you're right. There's If you're trying to be in stealth mode, this could cause some errors for research and what you're trying to find out there. So are right. you saying you're going to experiment with that a little bit or just no? No, we're going to pass on the drones. Uh, again, you get limited power. We've got electric outboards. We've got uh, Garmin. Um, we've got the uh, GoPros. So we're going to be doing all the charging <laughs> late afternoon, evenings, and mornings that we can. And then during the day, we're going to be on the river. Okay. Now, you mentioned uh, when the water levels are low. This is the best time of year when it is. How long does that last for? Is it last all the way till March? It's, it's really unpredictable, Jake. The seasonality element there in Cameroon is rather unpredictable. As a rule, uh, you're, by November, you're coming out of rainy season. It's high water. Um, so rainy season, August, September, October, it's really rainy. Uh, by November, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, December, January, then you start going into the dry season and water levels are low. You might be scraping up on some rocks and stuff. And according to reports, uh, this is from the pygmies, people that know this creature, that these creatures actually kind of go into a hibernation of sorts where they'll dig into Formation. the riverbank, they'll make themselves kind of a cave. And during the really hot dry season, they'll kind of go down in under there and kind of go into a, some of a stupor or dormancy. 
maybe even that's when they lay their eggs. And so their eggs are down there percolating while they're kind of taking it easy. Uh -huh. um, so that's, that's when they have seen some of the nests is during low water, warm season, but you don't see the creatures as active. The name Mokilian Bimbi comes from is Lungala. I think it is. It's Congo. Uh, and and, and uh, so what the Baka in Cameroon say is Likilabembe. That's right. Uh, but it's the same creature. And you can see the similarities in the world. The word Mokele and Bembe and Likilabembe, it's, they're quite close. If we're dealing with sauropods, and make no mistake, it sounds like they're sauropods. What kind of sauropod would this be? Everybody wants to point towards a Patasaurus, which was previously known as the famous Brontosaurus. I'm leaning towards something else, because if they're smaller, we might be dealing with a Camarasaurus of some sort. I think I said that right. It may not have. I think there are is. smaller versions of sauropods. Right. And, and some of them, including the Camarasaurus, has a rather large toe. Uh, I don't know if I'm making this really clear with my camera here or not. Oh, you're fine. Uh, yep. But you can see he's got a rather large toe. And one of the things that we hear about from the pygmies is that the key creatures have a thumb with a prominent toenail. Uh, and yeah. we see this on a number of the sauropods, including the Camarasaurus. And they say it actually uses it for digging out that cave. So it'll get in there and it'll help dig out that cave. Because uh, you wouldn't normally think of a sauropod as a digging creature. No, you but, wouldn't. You know, paleontologists have wondered what's the point of this, this, this thumb? Are they rearing up and scratching each other? Is it some kind of a defensive mechanism? Is it uh, something that they're kind of hanging on with, you know, when they're mating? We just don't know. But what the pygmies say is they're actually using it to dig out that cave. So when you think about a Mokilian Bembe, that's probably just the tip of the iceberg of what potentially could be out there. And when you go on your trek, you hear reports of giant crocodiles. Uh, the Sachamama, giant uh, anacondas. Does that concern you a little bit when you go on your trek, or is it just more excitement? Well, obviously, you got to watch out for snakes, and, and it's not always size that's troubling. Um, the poison is probably more uh, disconcerting than, than even the big uh, constrictors. Uh, when you look at the black mamba, okay, that thing bites you. It's a neurotoxin that stops your brain from communicating with your heart and your lungs, and you just stop you know your heart stops beating uh and you you know sometimes you got minutes <laughs> yeah that's a little disconcerting uh you know you're going to turn on your video camera you're going to say goodbye to your loved ones and, and that's it because we're not getting we're not getting out in time but again we're mostly hopefully you know going to be on the rivers last time we did a lot more hiking through the bush and, and we saw these and, and also bush cobras uh, so, uh, uh vipers bush vipers uh not cobras bush vipers so these things are these things are there they're dangerous um, large spiders, uh, yeah. that, you know, perhaps could be poisonous. And, and like you say, even just new things, uh, we don't know all that's there. Last time we heard about a ape like creature that runs around on two feet. Now I'm not really a, you know, a Sasquatch hunter or a Bigfoot guy. Sure. I haven't spent my time on that. You can't be an expert on everything, but I've talked to some of my friends that do research um, you know, the possibility of a large bipedal ape, you know, whether that's a skunk ape or a Yeti or whatever. Yeah. And I said, yeah, they, they called the Doty and it has like this bad hairdo and they'll say it piles up little piles of sticks and logs in the forest. And they'll say, stay clear of it because it rips up our dogs. If we get near it, we're hunting. Oh, wow. So we'll just stay clear of this thing. So, I mean, they're finding new species in places like Papua New Guinea and uh, the Amazon and some of the yeah. equatorial Africa on a regular basis. And a lot of times it's just an insect or, you know, maybe a frog or something. Uh, but, hey, we could find something really exciting. Something, you know, like when we found the Okapi or found the coelacanth. You know, yep. it was just, yeah. if I remember right, Jake, it was just 2007. They found a new species of monitor lizard in the Philippines. And these are islands that are inhabited. Uh, people traversing and yet it was living in trees people didn't realize it and some people began to tell stories about it and sure enough eventually they confirmed the existence of this large monitor lizard in you know well settled islands there in the philippines so yeah. what is in this swamp system 
that really hasn't been explored. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, there's so much. And what an amazing venture you're getting ready to go on. I So exciting. Excited for you and excited for what you could potentially encounter. Dave, there is something I'd like to share with you, get your personal opinion at the end here, but I'd like to read this article about Donald Prothero. I'm sure you're familiar with him. Donald Prothero remarks that the request for Mokili and Bemby is part of the effort by creationists to overthrow the theory of evolution and teaching of science by any means possible. Additionally, Prothero noted that the only people looking for Mokili and Bemby are creationist ministers, not wildlife biologists. Prothero argues that Powell Mackle expedition almost single-handedly popularized the modern concept of Mokili and Bemby to Westerners, yet was seriously flawed. Okay. Mackle's training was virology, which arguably did not qualify him to search for large exotic creatures. Really? So what does qualify to the all-knowing Donald Prothero? Um, do you have to wear a lab coat? That's what I'm wondering. Mackle seemed to uncritically accept eyewitness statements without considering the possibility people might lie or exaggerate for financial gain, for attention, or to impress American visitors. Well, what financial gain is there for natives who live out in remote, vast areas? This is all far away from civilization as it is, folks. Furthermore, Mackle was dismissive of Africans who denied knowledge of Mokili and Bembe, or who asserted the creature did not exist. Zoologist Marcelin Agena said he took a film of Mokili and Bembe in 1983, but the footage did not develop properly. Prothero describes the story as suspicious, noting critically details of the account have changed, and none of it was supported by their witnesses. All right. Now, how do you know that, Donald? Have you ventured to these areas to find out? Did you visit these regions? Hmm. Scottish explorer Bill Gibbons led two expeditions, one in 1985 and one in 1992. Though Prothero questions his motives as a creationist and describes Gibbons as not following even basic scientific principles. Okay, so what is your interpretation of basic scientific principles, Prothero? Journalist Rory Nugent's book, Drums Along the Congo on the Trail of Mokili and Bembe, one in which I've read, very tedious and tiring. The Last Living Dinosaur was published in 1993 by Houghton Mifflin. Nugent's book p- included a photograph he claimed was possibly Mokili and Bembe, but which Prothero argues was more likely a floating log. Dave, I'd like to get your personal opinion on this. I'm sure you're familiar with Donald Prothero, but I'd like to hear your personal take, sir. Yeah, well, he's kind of a, a, I would say, a bit of a blowhard. You know, you could just pick apart his statements from just a simple logic perspective. The only people that are looking for this are creationist pastors. And then he goes on to cite people that even he would say aren't creationist pastors. Roy Mackle, right? Teaches at the University of Chicago. He's an evolutionist. So that right there val- invalidates his first point. So he, he's just showing that he's not telling the truth. And if he's upset about the fact that some of these guys are not careful scientific researchers, okay, I agree. Some of them aren't. They're explorers. <laughs> they're naturalists. They're going out into the big world and, right. hey, they're open to find things. Uh, but what about him? He's supposed to be the careful, well-recent scientist to sit in his armchair and very you know diligently dissecting these reports and analyzing them. Yet he's making statements that are, you know, easily shown to be false and self-contradictory. So what I would tell them is, hey, let's back up a step. Uh, You've got lots of different people that have gone there and you've got lots of different lines of evidence. By that, I mean, you've got Pygmy's reports. Okay, you might not like the Pygmy's reports, but that's a line of evidence. You've got photographs of footprints in a nest. Now you might say, well, you know, I'm not buying those things. Okay, but it's another line of evidence. You've got uh, missionaries, uh, you know, they're interacting with new tribal peoples and they're interacting with them in two different countries, in Cameroon and in Congo. By the way, there's also some older reports from Gabon, but certainly lots from these two countries of Cameroon and Congo. Number four, we've got uh, this carving. Uh, I've got it on my website. I was able to procure this carving that somebody had just you know, bought there in the Congo. 
and uh, it, you know it was it looks just like uh, an attempt to recreate a sauropod dinosaur. It's yeah. really really good. And so you've got several different lines of evidence. And when I'm looking to do cryptozoological research, that's important to me. If I just have one person saying, hey, I had this weird thing I saw in my backyard, there's nobody to confirm it. Nobody else in the area has seen it. You know, I'm not too likely to go. Okay. But when we have multiple different lines, different mm -hmm. people, groups, different, you know, uh, missionaries that don't even know about the other missionaries, uh, you have... Um, you know, some pictures of what appear to be uh, footprints or appear to be nests. Really, is all, are all these people lying? Okay. So I, I can concur a little bit with Prothero. Hey, look, we don't have any good photographs. Sure. That disappoints me too. Uh, some of these people might be in question. Uh, did Marcelin and Agna, you know, make up some of this stuff? Is he completely trustworthy? I don't know. Never met the man. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, hey, my background is I have a master's degree in biology from Clemson University. I'm certainly not an ordained pastor. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you love God, I mean, that that I do, and I am a creationist. Uh, but if you look back in the history of science, some of the great pioneers of various disciplines were Christians, and many of them creationists, and they loved God. Agreed. Does that mean that you can do good science? Literally, our Western science is built on the work of people like Galileo and Kepler and Boyle and, uh, you know, on and on and on. And, and so even Charles Darwin. So what was Charles Darwin's degree in? Okay. It, it, you know, if that's what we're going to go on, are we going to throw out all of Darwin's work because he's got a theology degree? Or we're going to say, you know what? The guy was a pretty darn good naturalist and he made some pretty good observations and he was, you know, very careful and he wrote thoroughly, and we should give him some credit for that and actually seriously discuss his work. And even though I disagree with where his work has gone, yeah. I you know, think we need to discuss it. I think it does need to be treated seriously. And I think he made some good points against some of those who viewed fixity of species, even in his day, uh, that were too rigid about how much variation and how much diversification is possible. Yeah. I would agree with you. Well said, I think. And I would also say a note, who is the author of science? Now, we love science from a creation standpoint, but I want proper science. I don't want fake science. I want people to love science as much as I do, but I want them to be taught proper, which is something I never bought in school. I got a chance to teach science for one week because my science teacher was fed up with me. I debated him on the origins of species and life itself. Usually in a public school, you're not allowed to do something like that, but he let me teach the class for one week. It was pretty successful. I'll go into that another time. Dave, I want to say thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing this research, and I am really excited for you about your upcoming expedition. What a trek it's going to be. I do want to have you back on later in the new year so you can tell us more about what happened on your latest expedition. Second time that you're going to be going out there looking for this creature. And I sure hope you find something that you can share with all of us. Thank you so much for being a part of the Rope and Network. Well, you're welcome, Jake. It's always good to be with you. I would uh, just say for those that are listening in, feel free to go out to the Genesis Park website. That's my website. Uh, they can uh, get on our email list and, and hear firsthand uh, some of the things that are happening along the way there. Uh, I'll be having some pictures up and maybe even when we get back together again, we can share some photos of the trip and to circle back with you. It'd be my pleasure, Jake. That would be fantastic. Until next time, God bless you and have a safe trip. Thanks. The RRN Ropen Radio Network is brought to you by 511 Tactical. Always be ready. By Creation Evidence Museum of Texas. God's word in six days and by the Wildlife Safari, America's top cheetah breeding program. You are closer to Africa than you think. The concept of living dinosaurs inhabiting secluded regions of Africa has captivated researchers for over a century now. One such creature is known as the Inguma monini, it is a cryptid supposedly living in Central Africa of the Congo, Eastern Cameroon. It inhabits the Motaba River in the Republic of Congo. Described 
is a huge reptile. Length, 30 to 50 feet. Its body is two to three feet in diameter. It could be related to the Mokili Mbembe, as they both come from the same background and both resemble prehistoric animals. In Gugamonini are semi-aquatic, which means they move rapidly through swamps. It is carnivorous and eats birds and monkeys. The name derives from the Lingala language, the same tribes who named Mokili Mbembe. Three testimonials of sightings exist that took place near the Dongu Mataba, a tributary of the Umbangi River in the Republic of the Congo. The first one was in 1961. The second, 10 years later, in 1971, by Pastor Joseph Ellis. He estimated the length of the visible tail part as 10 meters or 32 feet long, equal to his dugout, no neck or head could be seen. These and other sightings were gathered by University of Chicago biologist Roy P. McCall, who led two expeditions to the Likuala Swamps in the Republic of the Congo while searching for the Mokili Mbembe. McCall concluded that the animal has a low slung body and therefore is more like a lizard than a snake. McCall also noted that the animal's large sail or diamond-shaped ridges were similar to, but smaller than, those of a similar creature. There is one more sighting that could add credibility to the other testimonies. However, this particular encounter took place 1,848 kilometers away in Kenya. Cal Bombay is a minister in Sudan. He has spent years of his life working with the people in Kenya. He went on to describe a very disturbing account he and his wife had while driving through the hill country of Moroni. Probably one of the most startling experiences I've ever had. It was about uh, in 1963, I think, and I was on my way through the old roads of Kenya back to Nairobi, and it was a hilly country in, near a place called Muharoni, and uh, that's down in the Rift Valley, but a hilly part of the Rift Valley. As we came up over the brow of the hill, my wife was with me, and suddenly laying there in front of us, right across the road, seven, eight, nine feet long, uh, was what I thought at first was a, a crocodile, and I thought, no, it can't be a crocodile, this is a dry part of the country. And then as I looked at it, we slowed down, stopped the car actually, and, and stood and sat there for 10 minutes looking at this. I mean, the, the actual word prehistoric went through my mind. I said, this can't be real. I've seen pictures like this, but not quite like this one. Anyway, from the tail right through to the back of its head, triangulars, perfectly perfect triangles, all the way from the tail to the, to the, for the head to the tail. And it was just laying squatted down on the road, seeming to sun. And uh, so I, I, I looked at the thing for 10 minutes. I, I could shoot myself for not having my camera with me that day, right. but I wish I had. But there it was, and I, I had never seen anything like it, and nor before nor since. And I've asked people. In fact, I went to the Natural Museum and said, have you ever seen anything or heard of anything in Kenya of this nature? And they said, no, there's nothing like that alive today. I said, I saw something. And I, I argued with them really rather intently for a while. And they said, well, it must have been a figment of your imagination. Well, my, my wife and I both saw it. And we, we asked for several years, we asked anybody if they'd ever seen anything like that. Nobody had, nor had I, have I since. But there it was, laying on the road, just kind of wandered off into a very dry, dry part of the country, bushy a little bit, not much greenery. It was a dry time of the year, and it just took off. And Mary and I just kind of looked at each other in wonder, saying, what in the world is this thing? I know a monitor lizard when I see one. This was not a monitor lizard. This had those ridges down its back. I, I had been preconditioned by all the education that I'd had up till that time right. that yeah. these things don't exist. It's possible that the same animal was described in the 1958 book On the Track of Unknown Animals by Bernard Huvelmans. In 1928, a snake-like animal was reported in the Umbangi Shari area. This report was made by game inspector Lucien Blanot, who later in 1954 also first reported the Emila Intuka, a possible ceratopsian dinosaur. According to this report, it killed a hippo in the Brosho River without leaving any sign of a wound. It also crushed a manioc field, leaving tracks one to one and a half meters wide. 
It does not frequent places where you find hippos, for it kills them. Finally, in 1945, the animal's tracks were spotted near in Delhi by Blanau's gun carrier. It is believed by some people to be a living dinosaur, most likely a Spinosaurid, a genera of rather gigantic crocodile-like theropods that dwelled on riversides, in rainforest, coastal and delta habitats. However, if you compare the sightings to the size anatomy of the Spinosaurus, then you will discover the claims to be inadequate. Spinosaurs were 46 to 59 feet or 14 to 18 meters long from nose to tail. The reports of the Nguma Monini stated the tail to be 10 meters or 32 feet long. Spinosaurs stood at least over 20 feet or six and a half meters high. Another flaw is that the Nguma was low to the ground while Spinosaurs were bipedal. If the Nguma Monini is a giant member of the Spinosaur family, this would be an amazing discovery. Nguma Monini is also described to be quite similar to the early ancestors of mammals, the synapsids, predatory ones such as Dimetrodon. This is another dinosaur with a large sail on its back. Dimetrodon size varied by species. The average Dimetrodon was about 8 to 10 feet long and 3.2 feet tall. The largest known species was 15 feet 24 inches long. So does Dimetrodon fit the bill? It is closer in size comparisons, but still not a perfect match. Perhaps this is just a misunderstanding on the estimated size. It has also been said that the Nguma Monini may be a larger member of the Varanidae family, the monitor lizards. Are these creatures surviving Dimetrodons? Or are they the Spinosaur family? Perhaps it is neither of the two. Perhaps it is another interpretation for the Mokili Mbembe, a living dinosaur inhabiting the Congo. One thing is for certain, these creatures may still be roaming Central Africa to this day, waiting to be caught on film, waiting to be discovered.